Britain experienced a revival and a great awakening because of the bravery and the faith of one man whose courage then inspired an entire society and generation. And this kind of courage is not only meant to transform individuals like you and me, but rather so that transformed people like you and me can transform our communities and transform our nation. America was founded by brave men willing to make hard decisions, to lead their families and communities courageously, and to stand unapologetically for truth. It excites me to see men gathering weekly trail life groups across the country to lead bravely, to talk together with their sons about things that matter, and to use outdoor adventure as a tool to engage with their community and mold their culture. In trail life, men across the country gather around campfires, building one another up in the truth of the gospel. Trail life dads seek to lead their families and communities well, challenging one another to be the godly dads or father figures that a generation of boys can eagerly watch and learn from. Trail life is the kind of thing we need available to every boy and dad in America. I can't encourage you strongly enough to learn more by visiting traillifecampfire.com and to consider talking with your church about starting a trail life ministry. Over the sagebrush and down towards the garden Out where the willows bend down with the wind If you could have seen it, you'd have to believe it Or you could just sit there and cry singing Hey, welcome back to the American Campfire Revival. I don't know about you, but uh, there is something that feels so good about being part of a larger community of faith. The family of faith, or the household of God as we read in the scriptures, is, uh, is, is something that God created so that we can bear one another's burdens, we can pray for one another, we can lift each other up, and we can give each other reminders of the promises that give us hope and give us confidence and give us courage. So thank you for joining with me. Your prayers and your comments uh, are wind in my sails. And um, the opportunity to just get outside at the end of a, of a long day of work and just pray with you and be reminded of where our hope comes from is very comforting to me. So thank you for joining me and I hope you'll continue to do that for the next 100 days uh, or so leading up to the election of the President of the United States who will be in charge of the executive branch for the next four years. Interesting times that we live in, don't you think? I mean, if someone is honest, we have seen a shift in leadership in this country and we have witnessed the social justice warriors and the progressive extremists sweep through our neighborhoods, leaving burnt out cities, devastated economies, broken schools left in tatters, a moral wasteland for our children, and people who fully intend to occupy seats of power in civil government to usher in a new secular humanist socialist America. Aren't you excited about that? 
And the family of faith, where does that leave us? Those of us who love God and love his word and believe that uh, if, it's, if it's new, it's probably not true, that truth is timeless, it's never outdated, and we wanna conserve the wisdom from heaven that got us here. We, as the family of faith, are expected to simply bow down to the new moral authority, to accept the new society, and to fall in line with the new way that things are run. But I don't believe that that's required. I don't think that's necessary at all. It never has been for people of conviction. It never has been an option for people of courage. They want to do what's right no matter what it costs them. And I'm not saying that that's easy. You and I have lived in, in relatively easy times. We live in a country with unprecedented freedoms, religious freedoms, educational freedoms, uh, financial opportunities. That's why everybody wants to come here. But the comeback that I believe may be on the horizon, the spiritual comeback for the family of faith in America is not just an opportunity for you and I to compromise with these destructive elites so that we can get a seat at the table. I'm not just talking about a comeback that results in an equal opportunity for us to be part of the discussion. I'm really not even talking about recovering something that was lost in early America and making America great again. I'm talking about something much bigger than that. I'm talking about a total transformation of the very ideas and the fabric, the morality, and the framework of our country that results in more liberty, more blessing, more protection for all citizens than we have ever seen before. Now, I believe that this is possible, one, because I have faith, and two, because it's happened before many times. In fact, I, I detail many of the revivals and the great awakenings that have happened in history in my new book, Born to be Brave. In the 800s, the Vikings were the extremists. They were the ones who were coming to destroy civilization in Great Britain. And they were butchering, pillaging, and burning their way through city after city, town after town, until they came to the kingdom of Wessex, where there was a king who had great faith in God, he was a Christian, and he had great courage. And he held back the Viking hordes led by their leader, Guthrum, for years until around Christmas time in 878 AD, he was finally driven by this heathen horde together with his family from Wessex and barely escaped with his life. And rather than making a strategic retreat to the mainland of Europe, like many other leaders had done for some freedom, he decided to stay in Britain so that he could fight for the freedom of his people. And he camped out on a high hill and watched the moves of his enemies and eventually began to cut off their supply lines. And, and he had a plan to retreat to the swamps where he learned how to hunt with his father as a young boy. And he sent out a message to the brave men of Wessex to meet him in the forest to plot and to plan on how to overthrow the evil forces that were dominating and burning this beautiful kingdom. And when he arrived, he was greeted by over 5,000 brave men who were willing to fight for what is right. And he trained them and he formed them into what was called a shield wall that was a military maneuver and he reminded them of the promises of God that if they would be faithful to God, no matter the outcome, he would be faithful to them. He marched them through the forest out to the, to the battlefield in the open where Guthrum and his army was perched on the high hill, obviously having the advantage of the high ground. And when they descended, they, they arrogantly thought that they would easily win the battle as they were led by their berserkers who were who were driven by drugs and demonic dedication in their own shield wall. And they would leap over Alfred's wall of soldiers only to be impaled on their soldiers' spears. It eventually turned into hand-to-hand -hand combat and there was a break in Guthrum's berserker's shield wall and Providence allowed Alfred and his troops to, 
take advantage of the breach, and they won the battle. Against all odds, when all hope seemed lost, against this great heathen horde, this powerful force. And Guthrum escaped to one of his sieged strongholds, and Alfred surrounded him and told him that he would either starve or he'd have to surrender. And when Guthrum came out, Alfred did something that was perhaps one of the greatest acts of grace and mercy of the age. He offered to spare Guthrum's life. He offered to save this butcher and even give him a portion of Alfred's kingdom to rule if he would be willing to convert to the peaceful principles of Christianity and defend what was right, and if he would be willing to submit to the Treaty of Wedmore, which would require him as a ruler to treat both Scandinavian and Saxon equally under the law. Guthrum gratefully accepted. His life was spared. He converted to the faith, and he was even baptized and became the spiritual son of Alfred and took on the name Athelstan. He was so grateful to Alfred for his mercy and his kindness that he was a lifelong ally in battle. And when he had his own coins minted in his section of the kingdom, he had his, his, his son in the faith name, Athelstan, engraved on his own coins. And all of Britain was saved. And people began to be so grateful for a man of courage and a man of faith like Alfred. And Alfred began to rebuild the kingdom. He began to plant churches and schools and the economy flourished and families flourished and civil government was now based and rooted in what Alfred understood was the ancient values that created the golden age that he had only read about in history books where people loved God and they valued his word. And he rewrote the law code of Britain and based it on the Ten Commandments and Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. And he said that if a man would learn the golden rule to love others as, as you would like to be loved and treated yourself, that he would need no other law book. If he could get a grip on, on that one thing, that government could be small, people would govern themselves and families and societies would flourish. I emphasize this to say that Britain experienced a revival and a great awakening because of the bravery and the faith of one man whose courage then inspired an entire society and generation. And this kind of courage is not only meant to transform individuals like you and me so that we can be rescued out of this evil world and taken to heaven, but rather so that transformed people like you and me can transform our communities and transform our nation and see wholesale revival everywhere. In fact, I believe that that is exactly the fulfillment of Jesus' great prayer that he taught us to pray. Lord, may your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. He didn't say just save us so that we can get out of here. It's not like we're on the, 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 the Titanic sending out a few lifeboats to save a few people before the whole place sinks. No, he said, Lord, may your kingdom come to earth and your will be done in our lives. And I believe in our society, in our nation. This goes back to the great mission in the Garden of Eden when God told the first Adam, fill the earth with children and then create the culture, govern it, subdue it take dominion over it. And that's a very specific command to create a beautiful culture that is rich and nourishing for the flourishing of all human beings. Heavenizing the earth is what this is all about, for the honor of God and the blessing of all people. Alfred demonstrated it, and he was just one of hundreds and thousands of people that God has used who understood their newborn identity, caught the vision of victory and they, they, they drew down on their birthright of courage. And that's exactly what you and I can do and what God wants us to do. Will you pray with me? God, thank you.
that you direct and encourage us not only with your commands and your promises, but also with real life, true stories of people like King David, of prophets like Elijah, warriors like Joshua, and even relatively modern day heroes in our time, like King Alfred and St. Patrick and our founding fathers and, and those who against all odds drew down on your promises. They stood on your word. They were guided by the, the, the light of your commands and they did amazing things. God, would you help us do what you've called us to do in our day? We may never fight the Vikings, but we have enemies of our family that we have been called to contend with. God, give us courage. Give us love even for our enemies and help us to fight the good fight your way. Comfort us, Lord, with your peace that passes all understanding. Thank you that you're working everything together for our good. We love you and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Appreciate you guys. See you in a couple of days. To get my new book, click on the link in the description or buy wherever books are sold.